Some of you did the uh, carotid subclavian exposures with me on Thursday. So if you did, you know there are two bellies of the sternocleidomastoid, right? The sternal head and the clavicular head. And so what we used to do to find the internal jugular vein is split right in between the two bellies. Um, so you can kind of see the little split here. And what it does is form a triangle. And that was the so-called safety triangle that we would access is before there were ultrasounds and everything everywhere. So we would access through the two bellies and usually the internal jugular veins right behind there. You aim for the ipsilateral nipple, believe it or not. That's not a really trustworthy landmark, but that's what they taught us to do. And uh, there are a lot of complications, but now uh, ultrasound is really standard of care to find the internal jugular vein. So going centrally, the jugular veins meet the subclavian and form the anominate veins on each side, right? So the right anominate vein is a relatively straight shot right into the SVC. That's why we kind of prefer to do right-sided um, tunneled catheters. The left anominate vein can take a series of turns and be quite tortuous, and that's why putting a catheter in from the left side is a little more dangerous because once in a while, somebody that has, doesn't have the proper wire guidance to put their sheath right through that anominate vein into the chest, clean kill. So what's that? Inominate, central venous occlusion, right? So, but what's filling? Right, so that's the azagous vein. So the azagous, azagous vein can become quite dilated, almost as big as the innominate vein itself. So it's an important collateralization around central venous occlusions. But not everybody, you know, venous anatomy is not your friend. It's very inconsistent. So not everybody has a well-developed azagous system um, because it can take a, a variety of pathways. So here's an example where one uh, entrepreneurial person put a tunnel catheter all the way through the azagous system. So it can be done in a well-dilated uh, thing, and it, what it does is inserts directly onto the SVC. All right, forearm veins. So the two main veins in the forearm are the cephalic and the basilic for our purposes, right? All right, so here's a dude with a well-developed cephalic vein going up the forearm. So the cephalic vein courses laterally along the forearm into the upper arm. Uh, now what's this? It's the basilic vein, right? So the basilic vein is relatively well preserved in people because phlebotomists and uh, IV nurses tend not to use it because it's kind of an awkward location along the medial forearm. So in a lot of people it's very well developed and it can be used. It can't be used as a primary fistula in most cases because of its location, but it can be translocated across the forearm uh, and create a what we call a forearm basilic transposition. I had to go to some pretty questionable websites to get these pictures for you guys, so <laughs> I hope it's appreciated. My wife asks, you guys back me up on that. Um, so the cephalic vein and the basilic vein communicate in the, in the antecubital fossa through the uh, median antecubital vein, right? That's important. We used to do these uh, arm vein bypasses and take out the whole basilic and cephalic vein for low extremity bypasses, and it's connected hopefully by a median cubital vein. So that's not the basilic vein you see in the form, the one that they love to stick for IVs and stuff. That's the antecubital vein, the connection between the actual basilic vein in the, uh, at the elbow is very, very medial. Um, so the arterial anatomy, you all know, radial, ulnar, and interosseous. An important variant is some people have a very well-developed deep brachial artery that connects directly to the radial. So if you see, if you're doing an a antecubital dissection looking for the brachial artery, and it seems a bit small and superficial, it might actually be a persistent deep brachial artery which goes directly into the radial. It can be used for access, but it's a bit smaller and lower flow. All right, so when we're exposing the brachial artery, what do we have to watch out for? That aponeurosis there is not the biceps tendon. The biceps tendon does not cross the brachial artery, but there is an aponeurosis that crosses it there, and that can be divided with no uh, disability. But what can't be divided is what? The median nerve, right? So the median nerve lies medial to the artery, so you always, in the antecubital fossa, so you always want to take care to preserve that. All right, so the median nerve starts in kind of a lateral position on the brachial artery where it's really essentially the axillary artery, crosses the brachial artery in the mid forearm and slides to the medial side. So knowledge of the median nerve is very important when you're dissecting out the brachial artery. Uh, and then as you get further up, more and more nerves come into play. So coming off the axillary artery, one of the complications that you dread is a nerve injury up there. Uh, we talked about the brachial artery anatomy. It's, uh, like I said, the main variant that's important clinically is that persistent deep brachial artery which feeds directly into the radial. 
Um, and then here you have a look at all the anatomy with the median nerve running from media, excuse me, from lateral to medial in anatomic position, and the aponeurosis crossing the brachial artery at the antecubital fossa. All right, cephalic vein in the upper arm goes through up to the cephalic arch and then goes into the subclavian vein. So the important thing about the basilic vein is it's subfascial, right? That's one of the main reasons it can't be used directly as a fistula. It has to be transposed, one, to get it above the fascia, and two, to get it away from the nerve. All right, the, the veins, again, inconsistent. Usually have paired brachial veins, but not always. Usually the brachial and basilic meet, not always. But uh, more often than not, they form a single axillary vein uh, right at the level of the shoulder. All right, and here you can see just all kinds of different uh, varieties of veins in the upper arm. So some people call it, you know, what they're calling the brachial is actually the basilic and vice versa. But remember, the basilic lies very, very medial. So anytime you're doing a transposition, important to get the ultrasound out and really identify what you're transposing. It's just a creepy picture. I don't know. Um, Anyhow, so physiology is very important. So why doesn't everybody get hand ischemia when you do a fistula? Magic. Have an idea? It's perhaps written on a slide behind me. Because when you do a fistula, you lower resistance in your arm by a great degree, and your body will actually increase the flow in that arm by five to ten fold. So the arm that has the fissure will get five to 10 times more blood flow than it did previously and more than the other arm. So that increase in blood flow is what causes steel to usually not happen. Um, the magnitude of flow in a fistula, how close it is to the heart, the closer it is, the higher volume the fistula, how long your anastomotic length is, that's very important. We're gonna talk about that separately. Uh, the patient's blood pressure has some effect, but that's not the main contributing factor. And then the vein size, the, the resistance in, the, in your circuit. All right, steel, everybody steals to some degree. It's normal for it to steal. The reason it doesn't become um, clinical is because you're usually well collateralized. So it's not anti-grade flow through the artery anymore, but it's well collateralized, and it's that amount of retrograde flow in the distal artery that we have to be careful of. Um, and then I actually couldn't find this online, so I took a picture in the textbook. So th this is an important slide, and this is demonstrating how the flow in the fistula relates to the size of the anastomosis. So this is the sweet spot right here, and you see that anastomotic length is between 40 and 80 percent the diameter of the inflow artery. So you do a brachiocephalic fistula, you want your anastomosis to be at least half the diameter of the brachial artery, but no more than the diameter. So if you have a five millimeter brachial artery, you don't want your anastomosis to be longer than five millimeters. And the reason is, as you get above that 100 percent of the length, you see only a modest increase in flow but a dramatic decrease in the distal artery flow. And here's where you get the retrograde. You can see at the bottom of the graph, that's negative flow. So you can see now retrograde flow in your distal artery, and that's what produces clinical steel when you have actual uh, retrograde flow in the distal artery, in the artery distal to the fistula. All right, so flow normally increases 50 to 100% in the first few weeks. Uh, you want at least 350 cc's per minute. Um, Europe, they used to tolerate, or they still tolerate a lot longer, but they tend to have uh, longer runs on dialysis. Here, it's kind of a more of a business. They want the people on the machine no more than three to four hours. So they tend to run them at a quicker rate. So higher volume, higher flow fistulas tend to work better. Uh, just anecdotally, if you see flow of <laughs> 600 or better, in a, in a semino fistula or a forearm fistula, that's good. A flow of a liter or more in an upper arm is what you're looking for. Um, after you put in a fistula, the patient has several systemic effects, increased cardiac output, lower blood pressure, increased heart rate, and increased cardiac work. Usually these don't become too physiologically, manif uh, too clinically apparent, uh, but they can in larger volume fistulas. We say the vein arterializes, what do we mean? It's hypertrophy, the smooth muscle cells, uh, increased elastin, increased collagen and fibrous tissue. So the vein wall essentially thickens, which is what we want. You guys know what this is? You include Ali Khan. What happens? Bronham sign? Right, right. So it increases when you, normal physiologic response, when you include a fistula, the blood pressure goes up and heart rate goes down. Good, thanks guys.